Hey everyone, Dr. Daria here, and I am so excited about today's guest. We have Yael Melamed. She's a San Francisco-based psychotherapist and leadership coach, but she also has a really amazing background, which I'm gonna let her talk to you about. She has her MBA from Harvard Business School. She had a life in the corporate world and took a 180 to become a psychotherapist and be focused on helping people actualize their potential and reduce suffering. So if you're stressed right now, if you're dealing with stress, if you're dealing with overwhelm or guilt or any of those feelings, Yal is the person you need to hear today. So Yal, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Daria. I want to share, and of course, you and I were classmates in school, so we go back, and I remember, I've known you from your prior life as well. Tell our audience what accounted for you to take this shift from the corporate world to doing psychotherapy and helping individuals? I had a really huge perspective change because at a very young age, I was diagnosed with cancer, with skin cancer. And at that point, I can still remember, I was actually at the Harvard Business School campus walking to Baker Library. And I literally almost, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. I saw my obituary written in the newspaper and it said things like, Yael was top of her class. She was valedictorian. And I realized that it felt very empty to me. And it just felt incomplete and not how I wanted to leave the earth. And that was a really, really profound experience. And from there, I decided to just shift into a life that would make me feel proud about my obituary. That's amazing. And, you know, I don't even think I knew that degree of the story as well. Um, but you really did. You went from this exceptionally successful world, life in the corporate world to now an exceptionally successful life in the, as a psychotherapist where you're impacting lives every day. I just was just thinking as you talked about that, I think we're all kind of having a moment of reflection with COVID and you know the sickness that we're seeing around us, however close or far some people may be. Do you see a parallel between that moment that you had there on the business school campus and the way some people may be thinking about their lives right now? Absolutely. In fact, I see every single crisis as an opportunity. In my, on my website, I specifically talk about the Chinese character for crisis is emergency and opportunity. And you know, these days with COVID-19, I feel that we're all facing death, whether there's anyone personally you know who's sick or you're sick, or it's just death of a, the way of life as you know it, your financial goals, whatever it might be, we're at the end of something. We're all facing loss. And to me, that's a huge shakeup. Um, it's a way of getting really humble and a way of really kind of checking yourself, evaluating, doing an inventory and asking yourself those same questions that I ask myself. Mm -hmm. Wait, this is, we're in a kind of like a pause. Some right. spiritual people are calling it a sacred pause. Mm -hmm. Am I happy with the way I'm living my life? If tomorrow were my last day, would I be proud of how I was leaving the earth? This is a really great time to ask yourself those questions yeah. and then to make the changes that you decide you wanna make. Yeah, I love that. And I do think we're kind of in a moment, it's, you know, like we're all kind of having a stress test. It's kind of a physical stress test. It's a mental and emotional stress test. It's forcing us to take that, that sacred pause you're talking about. And so then we can say, okay, I can look forward. Now I've kind of seen what some of my vulnerabilities are because I was pushed, um, which is something I understand working in the ER. So what I can do about it. And so I want to read, you had sent me an email. You said that I noticed many of my patients are actually doing better despite the isolation. Um, and I believe it's been that they've been working on an emotional and spiritual toolkit for a while. So yeah, I want to get into that. Like what is, when we talk about you know, from this, like what are really actionable things people can take away? What is a toolkit? Like, you know, what are the key components of a toolkit? And then later I'll kind of ask you, how can we customize our own toolkit? But, but what goes into that? I think of a toolkit, it's not like, oh, I have my ax, I have my drill, I have my hammer, but it's more of kind of um, your assemblage of thoughts, behaviors, and actions that you've kind of cultivated over time that you can draw on basically for the goal of resilience, to help you bounce back from adversity. And so it's, it's very personalized for everyone, but I can talk to you about some specific things that yeah. one could have in their toolkit. Yeah, I would love to know, you know, what are, for most people, what are kind of the one or two things that we really need to have in there and how do we build that? Well, for one is some kind of practice to cultivate presence. For some people that's walking in nature, 
For some people that's meditation, but being present is huge because in the present moment, there's no past, there's no future. There's just the breath that you have right now. And it has an extremely calming effect. Mm -hmm. Another one is a re is the ability to reframe. So, you know, you might find yourself thinking, Oh my God, I'm so sick of this social isolation. I'm going to lose it. And then you can remind yourself, oh, this, this social isolation is actually a huge act of love. It's an act of love for myself, for my family, and for society and public health as a whole. I'm doing something kind when I'm staying isolated. And then suddenly it takes on a whole new meeting and you experience it very differently. Um, connections, I would say, are part of the toolkit, making sure to stay connected to other people. That's an enormous resource and we often just get so busy and even if we're talking to people, we're not actually really connecting to them. You know, the Zen monks say that a joy shared is doubled and a burden shared is halved. So really, really focusing on maintaining true connections with people is something also very valuable to have in the toolkit. There, I could go on. There's actually quite a few other things, but those are some of them. You have so many good tools. Every time I chat with you and, and pick your brain on some of these things, I'm always impressed and I take away some, some little nugget. I want to unpack each of those. So meditation, uh, you know, let's go through that. Do you have your clients all start meditating? And if so, where do they start? I know for me, I am, a, uh, I am an aspirational meditator, <laughs> meaning that I meditate some days, not every day. And when I do, it's usually about 10 minutes, but it, it feels good. Like when you let yourself do that just for a few minutes, it just, even though it, it's kind of like, you know, exercising at first, you're like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't have time for it. And then as soon as you start, you're like, okay, th this actually feels good. What do you tell your clients to get them from the point of them being like, I'm not a meditator or I don't have time to saying, okay, I'm going to make this a, a habit of three, four, five, whatever amount of minutes. How do you bridge that gap? Because I think that's the hardest part. Yeah. Well, one of the things I do is I actually guide them through it live together. Sometimes when you don't want to do something on your own, it's helpful to just have some support and do it together. Mm -hmm. And often when they realize, wow, I feel so much calmer, so much more peaceful, mm -hmm. then they're sold just through that experiential mm -hmm. kind of activity. And I also talk to people about how you just said, I don't have time. But actually, it kind of saves time. It's an investment. When you're, when you're calm and centered, you think more clearly, you make better decisions, you're not overly emotional. So you end up saving time throughout your day because your performance is improved. And then for those stubborn ones, I will sometimes draw on Harvard research. <laughs> my point. I love it. You can come from multiple angles, whatever works. Do you have, just a side note, do you have any of your meditations recorded? If so, I'd love to share one with our listeners afterwards. So. I don't actually because I customize them to each person thus far. That's how I do it. I kind of know my patients really well. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of know what will appeal to them and I customize the meditations to them. Okay. Well, I may steal you to give us, lead us in a meditation at the end. Let's see how time goes or after this. So, um, cause that sounds kind of amazing. Um, I know you've done breathing work with us before on when I was at share care radio. So I know you're really good at that. Um, Okay, so moving from meditation, which I think is a great thing for people to do, and I think it really makes a big difference, to reframing, I think this is really helpful. Um, I'd love for you to give, you, you kind of gave one example of how to reframe it, and I think that's really important. A lot of people feel like they're, that sitting at home was kind of a helpless act, and reframing it as, no, this is you participating in our nation's way of trying to um, harness this virus, or at least get get a step ahead of it. What are some other examples of reframing? You know, we're all stressed. We, most people are handling more than they normally did because we're doing work and now we're trying to teach our kids and amidst uncertainty, what are some other ways we can kind of reframe when we start to feel overwhelmed? Sure. I mean, I think it's important for people to know that what you feed grows. So of course it's natural to have negative and difficult feelings. And I'm a big believer in acknowledging them, but not in feeding them, in feeling them, acknowledging them, and then doing the reframe into something more positive and then feeding that. Because like I'm saying, what you feed grows and you wanna grow the positive feelings. But reframes um, can be about so anything really. Um, you wrote to me about a woman who you had spoken with who felt like she was only doing 25% of everything. Yeah, and 
exactly you know, and just for our audience the, just that this was a woman who reached out to me and just so they have the context that you and i have y'all that said she's i feel like i'm only doing 25 percent of my job i'm only doing 25 percent of my job of keeping the house together 25 percent of taking care of my kids for their education and only doing 25 percent of what i should be doing in my marriage and she says she's like i give myself a failing grade in everything and that resonated so much and so i sent that to yell i said what do you tell this person because i think that what she's feeling is something that many many people are feeling yeah what i would tell that person first you know do the practical piece is there anything that isn't necessary that i can take off my plate and you know end up doing fewer things and a better job at all of those things but beyond that on the emotional side i would tell her the reframe would be from i'm a failure to you're being asked to do the impossible. Many of us are at being asked to do the impossible and you are doing your best. Your kids are going to be okay, even if they're not you know, having the perfect education over this time, there's probably other things that they're really enjoying, like the spontaneous time with you at home, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would reframe that into, I'm doing my absolute best. This is a really hard situation, not just for me, but for everyone and all we can ask of anyone is our best and we have our health we have a roof over our head and kind of turn it into the gratitude and that's how i would reframe that i think that's great and i think i think you're right in terms of instead of grading ourselves against did i do the full education for my children from 8 a.m to 3 p.m you just said finding spontaneous moments and i think that is part of it is like finding these little rich moments that i have with my own kids or that with my family or with my friends how can you do that can you kind of you know, should we be scheduling and saying like, this is the time that I'm going to be scheduling to go be with my kids and be with my family and truly be present? Um, what's the best way to be doing that? Again, the family situations are so different, but for me, it's about and just an awareness, an awareness of what my daughter is going through and that this is hard and she's not at school anymore. And so I've noticed that I just let loose on things. Like we'll be, we went on a walk the other day and she was going crazy in the muddles, as she calls them, puddles with <laughs> mud in them. Muddles. I, could, <laughs> I could find myself wanting to take her out and keep her outfit clean. And then I thought, let's just do the opposite. Let's go crazy. And we went, yeah crazy in the muddles and she got mud all over me on my face on her face and <laughs> people were stopping and commenting and they actually said you're such a great mom I would have never let my kid do that <laughs> um, and I would have never let my kid do that either but something about feeling so uh, tied down I just decided to do the polar opposite and that moment of spontaneity was so much fun for both of us such a release and also so much bonding yeah. And so I can't really speak to it for everyone, but I've just noticed loosening up on rules in different moments, noticing that we just all need fun. We need to let go. We need a release. Yeah. You know what I just heard you saying is that kind of deliberately finding moments just to say yes yeah. to, to those things. Because yeah. there's so often like our kids reach out to us and maybe it's a, a bid for connection or just something they want to do. And typically we'd be like, no, it's, it's, we got bath time and then we have bedtime and in a way like we're not throwing everything to the wind but we do have a little bit more laxity to say yes yesterday my kids we were out playing in the garden or i had to plant some things um that's one of my ways of like staying sane i like going, like you like to play in the dirt and my kids came up with the idea that it would be a great idea they took the hose i was trying to use to water the flowers one got the umbrella and got the idea they should shoot the water in the air and have it rain down on top of their <laughs> umbrella like the sort of thing that normally i'd be like what are you doing umbrella away of course that eventually devolved to one just turning it horizontal and shooting the other underneath the umbrella <laughs> uh, which I should have known that was coming but my first inclination was to say put the umbrella away this is getting messy and then yeah that that other voice of like say yes came out and I you know end up taking you know just enjoying it and that they invented this game yeah. and I think I think we just kind of need to deliberately remind ourselves to let that happen too right now to let go and, and nurture the creativity and the spontaneity yeah. mm -hmm. because then you can it, it then then we have the fun then we have those moments i love that so i'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes I'm circling say yes now connections um this has been hard for everybody i mean i've not seen my best friends in in person in what has it been six weeks yeah. uh, and uh, and, and that is hard. We've been seeing people do a lot of Zoom calls. Is that the best way? Are there any other ways that we should be doing this and engaging and nurturing these connections right now? I think ritual is very important. So 
something we do is every single Friday night, we light the Shabbat candles with our best friends and having that to count on, you know, in normal life, we don't necessarily do anything that regular, but I've noticed that having these rituals to count on has been extremely resourcing. Mm -hmm. um, aside from that, sometimes people could kind of do a drive by in the car and say hello from the car. And so it approximates in-person contact a little bit more. But aside from that, I think just the Zoom calls and keeping in touch and occasionally mailing letters or drawings or things like that, keeping some elements of surprise and really mm -hmm. focusing on caring for others, wondering what they might be needing right now and really sharing and caring is actually uh, resourcing for them and also resourcing for the person delivering those things. Yeah, exactly. I know there's, there's research that shows that when you give to somebody else, you gain happiness more than if you would actually use that money or time for yourself. So exactly. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and the Zoom and the letters, I hadn't thought about writing a letter. Um, but I love that. Actually, I'm sharing a video tomorrow on my, on my Instagram of when I gave my TED Talk, it was, you know, out of state and my best girlfriend watched it live and then recorded herself watching it live. And it's just an example. Like we were in thousands of miles apart, but she was sharing love and support and, you know, as much as, as if she'd been in the same room. And so again, like we don't, it feels better when we're physically there, I know, but we don't have to be, and we can still lean in whether it's virtual or not. Yeah, you're actually reminding me, one of my, mo the time I have the most fun over this quarantine is actually with one of my really good friends, and we do this Saturday dance party, and then we pin <laughs> each other on the Zoom, and then we talk on the phone, and it's kind of like we're out dancing together, and it's so ridiculous <laughs> and so wacky, and it's really, we have a great time doing it. I love it. So what's your music of choice for your Zoom dance party Saturday nights? Well, I don't choose. It's a DJ, but it happens to be old school hip hop. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. I think the theme from this is that if nothing else, we need to be finding ways in the solution. We're put in a scenario that we've never been in before. And it almost seems like the solution is finding creative, wacky, unpredictable, or unpredicted ways to enjoy ourselves that we would never have done before. Absolutely. Joy is the huge antidote to any kind of suffering or feeling trapped. Mm -hmm. Being happy, laughing, finding moments of joy is one of the best things you could do for yourself right now. And always. Yeah. What are your sources? So your Zoom call, your daughter, um, any other ways? I think you would also talked to me before about this being a moment where we have the external chaos and how do we stay calm on the inside? It's something I think about being an ER doctor a lot. And I think typically the, the general public doesn't think about it so much, but I think everybody's having to think about it right now. How do you do that? I mean, that sounds great to stay calm amidst the storm. I mean, poems are written about that. I know you mentioned the toolkit. Is there anything else that you really think of to help maintain that calm? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I have a very unique perspective because I'm the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. Wow. And what I kind of have realized from that is that the one thing no one can take away from you is your spirit or your internal world. Mm -hmm. And I have found that no matter what happens on the outside, you still have control over your inside world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the way you do it is if something upsetting happens on the outside, your meditation will help you be less reactive and stay more neutral. Mm -hmm. And then you just you realize that things change. The Latin root of emotion is emover, which means to move. Emotions move. And as soon as you're not so attached to them and you realize they come and go, you have a bad day, you wake up and the next day is sunny, you just don't have to take them quite as seriously. So what you really do is and it's not, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens right. through meditation, through psychotherapy, through all of these kind of things in the toolkit that we've been talking about through reframing and changing your neuron, basically, you know, mm -hmm. your brain. Um, yeah. But as you practice with doing that over time, you realize that even when something crazy is happening on the outside, you can always find a slice of peace or space on the inside. And that's always yours to return mm -hmm. to. Is there any exercise one can do in the moment? Um, I think it's really important we kind of take our emotional temperature because if 10 is when we're about to melt down, I feel like most of us are operating around a seven or eight right now. And once you get to 10, you're going to melt down. But is there anything we can do when you're at an eight or a nine to help calm that inner self before you lose it? 
Absolutely. When I start to recognize in that in myself, there's one go-to, which is just space. I just need to step away from the situation. I will tend to either go on a walk and I'm lucky to have beautiful nature pretty much in my backyard. And I just notice that that calms me down immediately. Sometimes I'll take my shoes off and just walk on the ground, on the earth. Ooh. That will, okay. it's all earthing. Um, that will really, really calm me down. Or sometimes I'll just meditate. I can do all kinds of visualizations and just, um, I might imagine myself in the hot sun in my favorite sunny place, mm -hmm. or I might imagine, just I might just listen to my the sound of my breath. I kind of create it and make it up as I go, but I'll just take a, a moment to return to myself and to find that place. Sometimes I have some of my patients imagine that they're holding their two arms up and then going all the way to the bottom of the ocean to the place where it's completely still and calm despite everything choppy that's happening above them. And so I'll do one of those things and return to that peaceful place. And then I'll go back to the situation much calmer. That makes sense. I love those. You gave a lot of like very tactical tips there. Um, I just like the one of taking your shoes off and, and walking around. And you know, what you said is, you know, that idea of disengaging, the idea that when you get to a seven or eight, not trying to power through it, but just, just disengaging for a minute, taking a moment to yourself. Um, like my family kind of knows, I, do that. I think that's something we could all share with our family. Like when I get to this moment or when any of us get to this moment, it's okay to say, guys, I need to, I need to step away for a moment and kind of have a plan. If you have young kids, if you're the only adult around and you have young kids, it's okay. Put them in front of a screen. Let, like, let them do something safe so you can go take those five or 10 minutes to yourself. And if, if you have a partner or another adult around, just let them know, I need to step away for a second and, and take that time. Absolutely. So, and then you said one other thing about the listening to the visualization, which I loved and uh, listening to the sound of your breath for people who are, again, who are not meditators. A lot of people won't meditate because they think it's going to take a long time to see benefits because they think you need to be the Dalai Lama before you'll see benefits. How quickly with your clients, when somebody starts meditating, do you start to see even small changes? Within 30 days. Okay. And that's with just kind of doing meditation on a daily basis. Yeah. Even five to 10 minutes makes a difference. Okay. All right. There you go. 30 days. Okay, all of us can do that. Now I want to move into relationships. You told me something which I thought was fascinating. And it's about the concept of rupture and repair. Can you share that for our viewers, what it means? And especially in, in light of the meltdowns we may be having in front of our family members right now. Yeah, rupture and repair is a concept in psychology that talks about how when you have a rupture in a relationship, a fight, an argument, an issue, if you repair it, you actually, the relationship ends up stronger and more resilient. And what that means is you don't have to be afraid of having a fight or an argument or conflict with someone, especially now. I mean, people are feeling the stress, people are not getting as many outlets. For some people, some people are extremely isolated and other people have so much togetherness, they don't even know what to do with themselves. And um, they can't get some space, they're just, everybody's together. Yeah. Right. So there might be more arguments. You know, I've heard friends say that they needed to violate the shelter in place and get a nanny. Otherwise they were going to get a divorce and they did get the <laughs> nanny and they're not getting divorced. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it can be really, really, really difficult. And the thing that I recommend to people is don't ignore if there was a fight, come back to it, even with children. Um, do the repair work because that makes the difference between it being traumatic and it being building. And the way you do that is once you take in your space and you feel calmer, you kind of come back together and you just say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm feeling really badly about what happened. This is what was going on for me, what was going on for you. This is how I wish I would have responded. And I'm really sorry. Yeah. I think that was actually really liberating for me to hear that from you because I'd had a moment where I'd gone to the grocery store and they didn't have detergent. So I went to a different grocery store and they didn't, it made multiple st stops trying to just get some detergent. And then I get home and what I really wanted to do was just to have been able to play with my kids that morning and had spent all morning trying to get detergent. I get home, I open the back door of my car and the detergent falls out and breaks. <laughs> and I lost it in a way that one should never cry over $7 detergent, but simply Symbolically, in my mind, it meant so much more than that, which is, I think, what's underpinning our meltdowns. It's never about whatever was the straw that broke the camel's back, but instead of just 
handling it. I, I didn't have your tools. Maybe I should have done the walking down, visualizing walking down by the ocean, but I, I lost it and I yelled at everybody. And uh, then eventually I did disengage. I went for a run, which is kind of my thing. Um, but knew what you had talked about. So I, I came back afterwards and I talked to my kids and apologized and, you know, talked about it. And, and we had a really great moment, my six year old and I, and she's like, mommy, it's okay. You just don't have to be so stressed about the detergent. Mm -hmm. you know, you're right. You're uh -huh. right. And, but it was really liberating to hear from you because I have so many women I hear and they're like, I just lost all my family today to hear it. You didn't do permanent damage when you have those moments, which we all have where we have the meltdown and you yell at somebody that you love. If you come back and apologize and explain and talk about what you want to try to do next time, as you said, you said we can make the relationship stronger. Absolutely. And in fact, if you never melted down, your kids would be pretty unequipped to deal with the real world. They would have no <laughs> idea go. how to handle conflict. They're welcome. They're welcome. <laughs> um, I'll try to remember that. Um, I'll try to remind them of that too, that I'm saving them thousands of dollars in psychotherapy later <laughs> from having, from not having a perfect mom. So there we go. Everybody who's not feeling perfect. Thank you. Yael, you always give me tools and you make me, you, you remind me that this is help helps normalize a lot of it. So thank you. Um, I, as we're rounding it out, I want to know for you, I think you mentioned rituals. I think for me, rituals are huge. I notice on those days um, for me every morning I get up and I, I run and it's okay. I'm not, I'm a slower runner in the morning, but I get my run done. And on those days that it doesn't happen, my day is off in terms of energy and food and yell, you know, just like my, my temper and my level of patience rituals matter to me, especially in this time. What's your ritual that kind of gets you out of bed? And then what's a ritual that just kind of helps anchor your day? I do have a few rituals. Every single morning, I have my kind of morning ritual where I meditate. And then I, you know, I wake up and I do snuggles with my daughter. And that gets my day off to an amazing yeah. start. Another thing I do is I always make sure that during my work day, I can go outside and take a walk. I actually wasn't able to do this when I had to go into the office, but now that I'm working from home, I make sure that I get a walk in nature or at least 10 minutes in the sunshine during the day because it just kind of brings me back to myself and makes me feel more grounded. And then at night, I make sure that at dinner we do um, rose and thorn. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. share that. About yeah, you talk about the rose in your day, the really good thing, and then the thorn in your day, which is the difficult thing. And that's about a lot about gratitude. Gratitude is a huge tool um, for changing your frame of mind. And so that's kind of a way to just make sure to bring that in and to be honest about mm -hmm. what hasn't worked. And then with my daughter, I have our whole kind of like nighttime ritual, which I didn't used to do, but I do now. And I find that it's very comforting to kind of do the same thing every single day before bed and then I shut off no matter what is going on. I make sure to shut off for about mm -hmm. an hour before I go to bed. And if I am going to read or listen to anything, it's always positive because what seeps into your unconscious right before sleep starts to really impact you. And so I really monitor what goes into my unconscious before I go to sleep. I think that makes so much sense. Being very deliberate about it. I've started now as part of my nighttime ritual is I shut off my phone at around nine or 9.30 PM. I'm not looking at it anymore. And last night, uh, and it makes a huge difference in my ability to fall asleep. Last night I was cheating and I was like prepping for this interview and I was like, I'm just gonna look at it a little bit longer. And my phone died. I was like, this is the universe. <laughs> this is the universe keeping me on my ritual. Um, but I think you're right. And I think in today's world of everything just feeling so nebulous and uncertain, I think it's our rituals that can anchor us to our day. Um, and help us feel better as we move through it and show us that we are moving forward and on days that it doesn't feel like we got anything done or moved the needle. Yeah, and it's also, it's that discipline and commitment to yourself mm -hmm. outside of all the things that you have to do. Yeah, so if there would be one tip you'd give for somebody right now stressing, uh, stressing and feeling overwhelmed, of all the things we talked about, what would be the one thing you would tell them that's gonna take five minutes a day and they should start to do? Do something fun that nurtures them. Whatever it is that they love, even if it's just watching one of these memes or something that makes you laugh out loud mm -hmm. is a game changer. Yeah, I love it. And I think like the big things, I have like things circled on my notes from today, but 
deliberately stretching ourselves in ways, not necessarily stretching yourselves in like self-improvement. A lot of people are, you know, brewing their own kombucha, which I don't even know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, but stress, stretching yourself to, to say yes to something to your family that you may not have otherwise done. So I'm finding those like unpredicted, wacky places of joy and fun and playing in muddles or, you know, creating rain showers with hoses. I feel like that was a big thing that we talked about. And then when you get to those moments that you're going to lose it, take off your shoes, visualize walking to the bottom of the ocean, walk away, take that time, right? Take that time and, and know that this too shall pass. This too shall pass. All right. Well, thank you, Yael. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I will be sharing it. Tell everyone where they can find you if they want to find you and follow you on social media, on your website. I know you're on Thrive. You're interviewed all over the place now, which I'm so excited about because everybody needs to hear your message. And if people want to see you as a patient, can they do that too? Tell people. Absolutely. You can just check out my website, which is a mouthful, yaelmelamed.com. <laughs> it's okay. We'll put that in the show notes. So wonderful. And then you're now on Instagram, right? Yep. Two days ago, I joined. I was telling Dr. Daria that I actually think part of my mental health instability is that I'm not on social media that much, but apparently you have to do it these days. Well, well I like what you also said, just as one last note is that you said kind of get choose your sources of news which is something i've been talking about is choose those sources and then get, get your information and then get off social media or don't have the news on in the background all the time absolutely i you know it's one of those things the yin and yang of social media there's so many amazing things it brings to us but there's so much damage like fomo like crazy and literally just the effect of your eyes and your brain being tied to digital things it really changes the way you feel so i think it's really important to use it appropriately and sparingly. And I think the basic theme for today is being deliberate. Deliberate about the what we let in, in terms of news and inputs and emotions and thoughts into our day, at time of day and the kind of thoughts, and deliberate of the outputs. What are we seeking? The, the fun, the saying yes, the joy, and finding those, because that's what's gonna get us through this and gonna make us stronger going forward when we're all out of this lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. I will put all the information for people how to find you. And 